Hello, and welcome to C++ Weekly. I'm your host, Jason Turner. I'm available for code reviews and on-site training. In this episode, I am going to discuss the top 10 resources for C++ that you absolutely must know about. And these resources are largely gathered from uh, feedback that I got from my followers on Twitter recently when I asked them what their favorite resources are. So without further delay, here is number 10. The first C++ resource that you really need to know about is the Reddit R CPP. And you know, Reddit has had its share of controversies here and there over the years. But the Reddit R CPP subreddit here is actually just full of constant news and information coming out. And you can see here just three hours ago, a standalone project containing LLVM containers. I have absolutely no idea what that means, but this is something that you could look at. A new release of WX widgets, MSVC backend updates to Visual Studio 2019, preview release from the Visual C++ team blog, this is a great way to have all of your information that you want aggregated in one place. And there's really no denying that you can get a lot of really good, useful information for up-to-date things that are going on in the C++ world from the C++ subreddit here. And now along the same lines as our Reddit resource that you must know about is the isocpp.org website. ISOCPP is a website that has the aggregate of most of the things going on in the C++ world here. Now, this is largely like Reddit, a community-driven resource where people submit things that they want uh, the community to be aware of. So there's the recent highlights, there's articles that have been published, books that have been published. Now, if you're not aware, there are in fact actually a fair number of C++ books that have been published in recent years. And that's something that we'll probably talk about a little bit more in a moment here. And if you are curious about recently released uh, YouTube episodes and CBP cast and, and then podcasts and that kind of thing, uh, it's all on here, upcoming events. So this is also a really good aggregate resource for news and goings on in the C++ world. Next up for number eight is actually leanpub.com. Now, leanpub.com might seem like an unusual choice to put here in the set of resources that you absolutely must know about for C++, but interestingly, they actually have a pretty wide C++ category. So leanpub is a website where people can self-publish their own books, and it turns out that it has become something of a favorite for C++ authors to use for self-publication. So if you look down here in the C++ category, uh, we can see that there's been books by Reiner, myself, Nikolai, uh, Bartwime, uh, Andreas Fertig, and there's uh, names that you probably recognize from the C++ community. Uh, many of us have actually been using LeanPub for a self-publishing platform, and this means that there's actually a fair number of C++ books available on here. Uh, that's just the top 10, but if we scroll through, there's, uh, I don't even know actually how many books there are in the C++ category. Well, as you can see, you can scroll through here and there's uh, dozens of books at least available for you to check out here on leanpub.com. And a lot of the more recent books about C++ are actually being published here. Now, this is not the only resource for finding C++ books for sure, but it is a very interesting resource, one that I suggest you check out to see everything that is available here. I definitely had difficulty deciding how to order these things at various points here. I, I don't want to downplay the importance of any particular resource or play up too much the importance of some other resource that everyone's going to be like, oh yeah, I, I know all about that resource, of course, because I watch your channel or whatever. So the next one that I'd like to highlight, one I don't think gets enough attention, but definitely should be used in your journey of learning C++ and deepening your knowledge is cppinsights.io. Now, this is a website from Andreas Fertig, who we just mentioned is one of the people who has self-published on LeanPub. 
So interestingly here, I, it seems that CVP Insights is actually respecting the fact that I've put my operating system in dark mode recently. But this is a tool that lets you put in any C++ code snippet. Now this is the default code snippet here. And when you hit this big play button, it's going to run it through Clang's front end, and it's going to show you the compiler's view of this code. So we just said create an array of 10 characters with the values 2, 4, 6, 8. And then we said we want to do a ranged for loop over all of the elements in here and call printf. And after we run this through CPP Insights and we get the compiler's view of it, we see that we've actually got 2, 4, 6, 8, and then the remaining six values have all been initialized with a character literal zero. And then we can see how the compilers actually generated the code around the ranged for loop to create the begin and the end iterators here, and then to loop basically while begin does not equal to end increment begin. And then it is getting a temporary uh, reference. Mm. Temporary is not a good word here. It's getting a reference to the element pointed to by the current begin iterator, and then doing the static cast to an int when it passes it to printf. So it really lets you peek behind the curtains of the C++ language and what the compiler is doing for you behind the scenes. And this right here is actually an extremely common question. You regularly hear people ask, like, oh, wait a minute, does a ranged for loop actually add more overhead? Does it check for the begin iterator on each iteration, or does it compare against the end iterator? Uh, you know, like, what is it doing? And if we run it here through CPP Insights, we can see exactly what it's doing. It actually does, in fact, save the end iterator, and it reuses this end iterator on each loop iteration. And there is no inefficiencies or anything like that caused by a ranged for loop. If anything, it might be more efficient than doing a hand rolled loop actually. So number six is a new one for this channel. I have never mentioned it on here before, but it is in fact a very interesting seemingly very tiny little resource here, but actually with a lot of power, uh, particularly depending on how you read and research C++. This is the wg21.link website. Now, if you are involved in the C++ standardization process at all, you're definitely already familiar with this website. If you aren't, then there's a very good chance that it's actually new to you. So if you just go to wg21.link, this is all you get. It's just a, a list of all of the possible ways that this URL can be used. So if we were to go to wg21.link slash std17, it's gonna take us straight to the C++ 17 final working draft the one that was used pre-publication of the C++ 17 standard. And if we go to P whatever, it's gonna give us the last public revision of some paper that was submitted to the committee. And if we go to wg21.link slash GitHub, it'll actually take us to the GitHub website where C++ issues are tracked. And if we go to this one, this wg21.link slash index.html, perhaps not surprisingly, this is actually an extraordinarily long web page. It's kind of fascinating to see how well my compression can keep up here. So this is just every single issue that can currently be referenced in the C++ standard. So the specification for vector of bool, right? What is that about? Specification to deprecate vector of bool. Interestingly, I had no idea that there was ever a paper to deprecate vector of bool. So we can click on this and we can see the, the link that it was gonna take us to here. So this paper was published in 2007 by Alistair Meredith. Now it's actually an idea to deprecate vector of bool. Now, interestingly, Vector of Bull is on my to-do list for episodes to record about. Like, what in the world makes Vector of Bull special? 
And if you don't know what makes Vector Bull special and weird, then uh, that episode might end up being surprising to you. So there is just a crazy amount going on in here. And it goes back actually very far. Uh, if we can just kind of scroll to some of these issues here, we can see like core language issues that were published in 1999 and discussed and what papers were submitted to them. So an amazing resource for researching the C++ standard, but also keeping in mind these shortened links down here. Now down at the bottom, we can see wg21.link slash cwg131. So that shortened URL will very handily take you to the actual paper location if you want to use it that way. Number five is definitely one that I have covered before. And this is the eel.is website. And specifically, we are talking about the C++ draft URL for eel.is. This is the up to the minute standard of the C++ programming language. This was generated on March 28th, 2021. This includes, as much as possible, every single paper that has been merged officially into the language. So we're looking at the working draft for C++23 at the moment, actually. And this gives us a really handy way of, if we needed to you know, find something about the associative containers, and we want to reference to a friend a particular paragraph or somehow link to this on Twitter. This is amazing because we can just copy that URL, paste it into Twitter or whatever, and it gives someone a direct link back here. Now, you may have some concern about actually using the up to the moment version of the C++ standard. So it's worth pointing out another feature of this website to you. For historical versions of this document, check out the CPPWP page. Let's, in fact, do that. So this actually takes you to a GitHub page, and we can see on here that there is other hyperlinked versions of this for C11 or 14, and we can go to the HTML version of it here and have hyperlinked versions of a particular version of the standard that we can use for linking from there if you don't want the up-to-the-minute version of the page. And as every version of this website points out, these are completely unofficial generated versions of the standard. So if there's some error or something in here, not the problem of the C++ standard committee. Number four is going to be definitely a classic standard for longtime viewers of this channel. No question, most of you will already be familiar with this. Now, of course, I have been using godbolt.org or Compiler Explorer since the very beginning of this channel. So the gcc.godbolt.org is old school from when there were multiple compilers, uh, programming languages supported, and you wanted to go to the gcc.1 to get there. And then it got all merged together nicely. And then there's uh, compilerexplorer.com, which is the most modern way to get there. But all of the URLs work across the domains. It doesn't really matter. But of course, Compiler Explorer. Now, even though you've probably seen me use Compiler Explorer many times and probably used it yourself many times, there still might be a few things that you don't know. Now, I'm certainly not going to dig into all of the possibilities here, but I just want to do at a high level show you that there are in fact many different libraries that you can select from and use inside of your Compiler Explorer workspace here. If you are, you know, not terribly interested in the actual disassembly that's been generated from your C++, which I have no idea why you wouldn't be interested in that, you can actually do an execution only view of your code and get rid of that window. And then we can see here it's trying to compile and execute it, but we don't have a main, so it can't. Here under tools are a ton of tools, probably many that you're not even familiar with. So there's PVS Studio implemented in here, Clang Format, Clang Tidy you can play with, things for analyzing the actual binary. This x86-6502 to is actually the same tool that I used for my Commodore 64 talk that I gave at CppCon back in 2016. 
So if you are, so if you're interested in trying to play with that tool, it's here to play with. Now I must say there are many caveats to using it. And if you go to use it, then you're on your own really. Um, but you have lots of different options for how to filter and change things here. And you can do things like, let's see, this is what GCC is generating. Now let's go ahead and add a second compiler. Now we can do clone this compiler. That's a handy way to do this. And we can say, I want to compare to Clang Trunk. And then I can do an add diff view here. And this will actually show me the diff between the two different compilers assembly output. And now this all is starting to look very cluttered, right? But it is actually possible to drag and drop these windows. And let's make that slightly larger and pull this one down here. So we can now switch back and forth between the two compiler output views, and we can look at what we've got here. Now, if I want to say, wait, okay, I've got GCC trunk and, or GCC 10.3 and Clang trunk. Now I just want to go ahead and compare like optimization differences. And we can see that once we enable the optimizer, it can do different things, of course. And if we want to look at fully optimized versions between the two, now we see there is actually no difference between their outputs for this trivial example. So there's probably a lot of untapped power that you have not played with in Compiler Explorer. So I encourage you to play around with it and see you know, what else you can learn simply by playing with the tools and libraries that are available here. Now we're getting pretty close to the end here with number three. and I may or may not have surprised you with any of these items yet. And number three, it's definitely not going to be a surprise. It's going to be something that you've accessed many, many times, almost certainly. And in fact, it was uh, by count the most referenced thing when I asked Twitter what their favorite C++ resources were. And But the the next two things that come up after this are aggregate things that uh, actually end up with more total references. We'll get to that in a moment. Now, of course, you really shouldn't be surprised to see that cppreference.com is in fact our number three thing. But there's probably one feature on here that you aren't aware of. Now, I am currently logged in to my cppreference.com account. And you might see here that there's this little window that says standard revision, and it currently says diff. I can say, I only want to view the C++ 11 version of the standard here. Now this is still showing me, you know, string conversions, utilities for some C++ 17 and such. So let's go ahead and dig into the strings library. And I have here this string view and all of these things that we, uh, were added after C++11. So let's go ahead and put this in C++11 mode. And it just automatically filtered these things out. So if you don't want to be cluttered with all of the different things that exist in the C++ standard, we can specify, okay, I only want to know things that are in C++17. You can get this nice, clean view in the CVP reference pages. To enable this, you must create an account and then go into your preferences page and then click on gadgets and then enable the gadget standard revisions. So I'm guessing this is a feature that some of you will find actually pretty darn exciting because I've seen lots of people ask about this on the internet. Then of course you can actually click here and you can look at any particular version of the standard also from uh, the language feature perspective and which compilers have implemented those features for both the standard library and the compiler. It also has a C reference, which we've never talked about on this channel, but C was updated in 17 and it has a C23 standard coming up as well. So, you know, C and C++ are closely related. Knowing something about C or looking things up here could be very helpful to many people. And then there's also the offline archive. Now, if you find yourself, you know, away from internet access for a while or something like that, then you can download the archive of cppreference.com and have that available to you on your computer. Now, it does seem that it's been a while since the offline archive has been updated. There's also this external links site 
that gives you PDF and HTML versions of these things and shows you some of these other links that we've been talking about in this episode. Uh, number two, many, 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 many people mentioned things in this category that I've decided to just go ahead and wrap up into one place. There are a lot of C++ blogs right now, but there's a relatively small handful that I'm aware of that are updated on a regular basis. So I just want to go through and highlight a handful of these blogs. Now, the first one that I'm going to highlight is Jonathan Bacara's Fluent C++ blog. Jonathan has been releasing at least one article a week for a very long time. And Jonathan has organized these articles in their tap topics so that you have easy accessibility to them. And then has also gone in and done this, what he refers to as dailyable content. So many of the posts will say this is a dailyable thing. And he has this outline here on the website under daily C++ as to how you can have a 10 minute presentation every day with your team to discuss some aspect of C++. And there's a whole collection of articles under here that are good for exactly that kind of thing. Now, the next one that I want to highlight is C++ stories. This is converting from B um, This is Bartwime's or Bartex blog that you may be familiar with from his other URL. And this is again, something that has update just regularly and consistently published in the order of once a week, maybe a little bit less, maybe a little bit more often. Um, he's self-published several books. These are some of the books that we mentioned on uh, the leanpub.com number eight that we covered here. And just lots of really good info regularly published on the site. Now, the third one that I want to highlight is Sutter's Mill. This is Herb Sutter, and Herb Sutter has had this guru of the week set of postings. They go back a long time, but Herb has continued to add to these and update previous postings over the years and has done, you know, something like at least one post a month since 2006. So that's a pretty good set of things on here. Now, Herb is the chair of the C++ Standard Committee. So his articles are absolutely well researched. Next up is the blog of Bruce Dawson. Now Bruce doesn't publish as consistently as the other people that I have mentioned, but Bruce's articles are always extremely interesting. They tend to dig into just next level things and layers about debugging the interaction between like the Chromium browser and the Windows, you know, networking subsystem kind of craziness. They're always very interesting, deep technical blog posts. And this might be something that you'd be interested in checking out. Next up, I would like to mention the Moderna C++ blog from Reiner Grimm. And this is one Reiner's updating, it looks like, every week also with lots of good information and articles, consistently published things that you should definitely check out. And of course, I can't let this go without mentioning Raymond Chen, who is probably the most consistent, prolific C++ blogger ever. I don't know if it would be possible to catch up with Raymond because he has been publishing an article every single day since 2003. I guess that's technically every single weekday since 2003. That is a lot of articles. Now at the time of the publication of this video, Raymond is in the middle of a series on coroutines. And coroutines are here in C++20, and if you have any interest in them, Raymond has split this up into a bunch of bite-sized chunks, and you should definitely check out the blog postings here about C++ coroutines on the Old New Thing blog. At this point, there's only one thing left that I haven't talked about, and you really shouldn't be surprised because, of course, YouTube. Um, there's so many resources on YouTube. You're watching this video on YouTube. But there might be some YouTube channels that you're not aware of. Now, you're probably watching this video on my YouTube channel, C++ Weekly, 
So let's just go ahead and get that one out of the way. At the time of this publication, I've got 67.1 thousand subscribers. Here's hoping for 100,000 in the near future. I had many, many people mentioned the Cherno on this Twitter discussion about what are your favorite C++ resources. I must admit, I have not watched any of these videos, but he is a very popular YouTuber. 363,000 subscribers. So you should probably check him out if you've got uh, any interest in these topics, things, binary operators, game engine series. Uh, it's a lot of, you know, kind of just teaching about C++ stuff. CBPCon came up many, many times. There are hundreds of CBPCon videos up here. Now, CBPCon is just one of many conferences. It's the conference that probably produces the most videos for YouTube. So, you know, they're here. There's lots and lots of videos. There's like an insurmountably many videos on the CBPCon YouTube channel. And for every single talk given of every single year of CBPCon, they're all up here. And it's just hundreds and hundreds of videos. I and mean, we're just looking at the 2020 CBPCon. So we've got the regular daily videos and the lightning talks for every single year. It's a, a lot to go through here if you are interested. Next up, we have uh, The Real Bisquit, and I know a lot of people like this YouTube channel, so sh be sure and check it out. There's also lots of like 3D game programming, rendering kinds of topics, and another very popular one. Next up is the One Lone Coder YouTube channel with uh, some really interesting stuff with a game engine that was created just for the sake of being able to teach things on the channel. And it looks like a lot of really awesome things on here. And definitely you should check this one out as well. And on the topic of conference YouTube channels, there's the Meeting C++ conference channel. And there's so many others. Uh, I just mentioned CVPCon and Meeting C++. But once you go down this rabbit hole, you can find the YouTube channels for the 10 or 15 different C++ conferences that have released videos out here and, and go and find all of the interesting things that have been published at C++ conferences around the world over the last several years. All right, so there you have it. Those are our top 10 C++ resources that you absolutely must know about. I hope you enjoyed this episode. Be sure to subscribe. Go ahead and feel free to comment if you think that I left something out. I probably got something in a different order than you would have put it, but uh, here we are. So thanks again for watching this episode of C++ Weekly.